one minute. Are we ready? Praise the Lord, everyone. Let's stand as we get ready to start this service this morning. On a beautiful Sunday morning, we welcome those of you who have joined us on Facebook and on MyNewLifeTampa.org. Amen. We're looking forward to God moving today and changing some lives. How many need their lives changed today? Well, guess what? The choice is yours. God already is here, and he wants to make the change. So if you want the change, let him make the change in you today. Amen. Come on, brother. Willie, open us up in prayer. Praise God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Father, we come before you this morning, Father. No other help we know, Father. Lord, in face of all the opposition that we face, the things that's going on, we can be assured, Father, that everything is under control. Father, because we know you are the God who cannot fail. Father, we pray for those that are sick and needy this morning, Father. Lord, and those that need encouragement, we pray your encouragement. We pray the blessing upon the singers, upon the speaker. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Remain standing for the worship team.
So nice and pretty and money in your pockets to give in the offering. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't want this to take away from your offering, but let me just tell you last though, I think it was Wednesday, or I don't remember when, I wore this hat, Make America Godly Again, and uh, so many of you people wanted to get one, so I was going to go online and get them cheaper, and they're like $25, $30 online, but I was able to get them through Somebody Cares, I paid $10 a piece for them, I bought 10 of them. And so if you, if, if anybody wants one after church, I have like six left, I think, uh, but they're $10 each. Don't ask me for credit. It's cash on the line, okay? All right? Don't say, oh, I'll pay you next week. No, when you get next week, I'll get you one then. But anyway, uh, the theme behind this is uh, somebody cares Tampa Bay, uh, Daniel Bernard, and several churches in the Tampa Bay area. The election's coming up, and I know it gets heated, and we have Democrats and Republicans and all this different stuff, and people say, well, I'm a Democrat, I'm a Republican. And what we're trying to do is take the emphasis off of all that and say, okay, in your decision, don't worry about Democrat, Republican. Vote for people that are godly. Vote for people that have their, um, 
their what they believe and their policies are are as close as possible. They're not always going to be exactly like yours. I change mine from day to day, so I can't agree with myself from time to time. You know, but you know, if, if you're um, if you're uh, against um, abortion, if you're against the uh, not having any um, lines on the border, you know, and if, if you're against um, uh, defunding the police and these different, some of you probably do want to defund the police, but um, anyway, um, I don't know what, uh, some people who want to defund the police, if all our police today went up to um, uh, Pasco County for a donut convention, I think that um, we probably wouldn't make it home without being either killed or robbed or something. I mean, they're necessary, right? got to have them so but all these different issues that are on the ballot look for people that have similar beliefs to yours and um, the goal is to make America God you can't make America great again without making America godly again amen That's what it's all about so uh, anybody wants a hat like this let me know after church and I'll get you one for ten dollars cash on the barrel okay make America godly again and i really like that theme uh it, it just seems that like that should be the theme of all christians is make america godly again it's what we want to do i mean we've, we've turned into a godless society uh, america has uh, has put the constitution and all these different things into question and and uh, there was a professor last week in one of uh, the main colleges um stood up and said to her class that there is only two sexes male and female and literally, the whole class walked out on her. If that isn't insane, I don't know what's gotten into our college kids. We need to reach those people. We need to reach these people and, and help them stop that insanity that's going on out there. How many know it's insanity? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's crazy. Well, we're, we're, um, we're, on the, we're on the brink of nuclear war. Uh, and, and that's not just a statement. That's not that our, our own president said that. Okay, we're on the brink of nuclear war. These things could happen, but we need a godly society that can make godly decisions, amen? amen? And no matter what comes, hell or high water, we are ready for whatever comes our way. So, uh, but anyway, uh, that's my two cents on that. All right, today, um, after church, Sister Jenny and I are going to make a big sacrifice. Everybody go, oh. oh. We have to go down, after church today, we have to go down to Ybor City to the Italian festival. And uh, we have to be judges of the Italian sandwiches. Yeah. It's quite yeah. a sacrifice. When we, we were judges on the, on the Cuban sandwiches. And I will tell you, by the time you come to this, they give you little bites to taste and you have to rate them, you know, one through 10 on different things. And by the time we got, Jenny and I got to about the 17th or 18th sandwich, nothing tasted good. <laughs> nothing was good. But, Anyway, we'll be going down there, and uh, we have a booth set up down there for New Beginnings uh, that we're going to be setting up and different things. So we'll be down there at that, at that festival. If anybody, it's free. If anybody wants to go down there and, and see us, uh, come on down and, uh, and see us there with our booth. And you can see us judging the sandwiches, right, Jenny? Yeah, so we decided to make that sacrifice. They ask us to do this every year. But anyway, let's go ahead and get ready to take up a... Sunday morning tithes and offering at festivals from 12 o'clock to 6, I think, tonight. It's at in Ybor City, at Centennial Park, right in Ybor City. All right. Amen. We have a booth down there, and Dave's going to be running it. We're, uh, where's Dave? Is he out here, or is he getting the stuff ready? Dave, are you out here? I think he's in the back getting the booth ready. But Anyway, uh, and Sean and Jimmy are going to go down there, but Dave's going to represent and give his testimony at his booth and talk about what God has done for him. And uh, let's hope that we reach some people down there today. Amen? Amen. 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 Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your blessings. We thank you, Lord, that we can have the opportunity to serve you, O oh God, that we can give of our offering, O oh God, to you. We thank you, Lord. Bless this offering. Bless gift and giver in your precious name. Amen. Amen. He had a real senior moment. Two of the easiest songs we ever do in this church. And he messed them up. Thank you. 
not make it here Wednesday night, uh, this last Wednesday night, it was um, a different service than we normally have. It was great. How many were here? Fantastic, wasn't it? Uh, I, would, I would ask that you guys who, who haven't seen it, go on the um, website, mynewlifetampa.org, and, uh, and, and watch Wednesday night service. Uh, it could definitely change your life. It was, a, it was a very great service that we had Wednesday night. Amen. All right. Um, one other thing, uh, Herman, Brother Herman, we have our Spanish church uh, Sunday afternoon, and I know that we have a few people here that are primarily speak Spanish. Meet with him after church today about about being part of that church. Testify, Herman. Tell us about your church. Glory to the Lord. Hallelujah. It's wonderful when you serve the Lord. Praise God, praise God. Yes, we got a service on uh, Sunday at uh, 12.30. We got the Bible study. And then at uh, 2.30, we got the service. Back to the service. Also on, I should say, seven Yeah. <laughs> Domingo, para aquellos que no hablan eh, inglés, Domingo tenemos servicio aquí a uh, la escuela bíblica a las doce y media. Yo tengo los flyers, tengo los anuncios, tengo todo. Así que los domingos a las doce y media, con la Biblia, a las dos comenzamos el culto evangelístico. Y también tenemos los martes a las siete de la noche, tenemos oración, estudio bíblico, y los jueves también tenemos servicio de adoración. Así que si usted no habla eh, inglés o habla poquito, no es siempre, no es excusa. 
porque tenemos culto, por la gracia del Señor, tenemos culto eh, en español, ¿ok? Así que véame después que se termine el culto, véame. Amén. God bless you, brother. Amen. All right. Uh, no, but that'd be a, yeah, we do have flyers. Well, bring them next week. All right, bring them. All right, we're excited about our Spanish work. Amen. All right, the message today is passion and power. I got a little, just a little 60 second film for you to see first before I preach. Passion and power. Go ahead, Jeremy. When we talk about passion for God, it's not just words on paper. It is the essence of what we are about. It's the foundation that determines all that we do. That's what passion for God is. And that's worth giving your life to. In God's economy and God's scale, it's not what we do for Him, but it's knowing Him and, and loving Him. And from that, He causes us to do things that we never thought were possible. This country's been closed for so many years, and God has busted those doors wide open. And He's drawn numbers and numbers of people to come and to live and to worship Him in this place. Being on the mission field, you realize how little you can do, and that it's God who accomplishes great things. Prayer is the most awesome tool which we carry because prayer is what refocuses us on God. It recalibrates us with that which is on God's heart. If it wasn't for passion of God as being really our number one and really our only main goal, then I think it would be really easy to get discouraged and to give up. I can't lie and say that it's easy to live here. But if you're living, doing what you know God has called you to do, and you're living out that passion, you're getting to experience what he's doing in a place like this, I mean, that's life. If we're not living recklessly abandoned to him, then, then what are we doing? Passion for God, for me, transforms all of life and all of, all of the relationships in which we're involved. I think that the way in which we treat one another because of our view of who God is, is going to determine just how effective we really are. Because Christ said it's by our love that they'll know that we are his disciples. God's heart is for all peoples of the earth and to bring everyone into his kingdom. All right. Amen. Passion. Let's all say passion. passion. Is what drives us. Amen. And we need to focus our passion, but passion is what drives us to do what we do. Amen. Amen. Those who uh, come to church Sunday morning and uh, they're just kind of going through the motions, you, you can tell. hardest things of being a Christian is being a Christian with no passion for God. If you don't have passion for the things of God, you are miserable. It pains you to open your Bible and read it. It pains you to sing the songs. You can hardly wait till the service is over. You can hardly wait to go home and do your thing. If you don't have passion in your life, either get it or you're in trouble. Have passion. We all have passion for things. I think some of you, when you were out there on the street, man, you had passion 24-7, getting up in the morning. Where am I going to get my next hit, right? <laughs> oh, I got to go get it. Oh. Or drink. Oh, I got to make it to the refrigerator. I've had some even said they couldn't make it to the refrigerator. They had to have the beer by their bed so when they woke up, they could have a beer before they got out of it. Isn't that pitiful? But I just, I think it's amazing. People will have a passion for the things of the world 
And uh, you go to a football game, and man, people are going nuts, right? Those that aren't drunk by the first quarter. Every time their team makes a goal, it's like you think that heaven came down and glory blessed their soul. Man, you know? Uh, they're getting all excited over that dead pig flying through the air. And uh, uh, man, uh, how excited. Super Bowl? We've had a few Super Bowl parties here. And I've seen guys who barely barely get up and barely open their mouth during song service when that thing is on the screen and the teams, the Bucks are winning. They're going nuts, right? And then when someone like Sister Rita here, who just lost her husband a couple weeks ago, is sitting here on the front row, raising her hand and singing, power, power, wonder-working power. And she's singing here, singing it with power. What do you think the difference is between someone who just lost their husband and is able to come to church and sing with the passion she has and some of you that have nothing else bad going on in your life and you can barely make it to stand up to sing a song? What's the difference? Passion. Willie, what keeps you going? Passion. you got to have passion in your life. I hate telling this one, but it's the truth. Uh, sometimes I enjoy doing the honey-do list, but a lot of times it's like, okay, tomorrow morning, I got a list of things. Jenny likes making lists and lists. And as I do each one, she crosses it off, and it's kind of neat. I get to get crossed off on me. And uh, she makes that list. I get up in the morning. It's like, oh, I don't feel so good. And I can barely make it out of bed, and I go to the shower like you ever see that Irish Spring commercial where they drag the shower, and then after they get the Irish Spring, it's oh, 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 oh. and uh, I got that honey-do list. Then, on a day I'm going fishing, I'm up at four looking at the clock. Oh, it's not daylight yet, man. I get uh, five o'clock. Ah, when are I? I'm hopping out of bed at five thirty, man. I gotta get going, get this. Daddy, get up. We're going fishing. Ah. What's the difference? Passion. It's the driving force. Now, you can't just have passion for God, but you also got to have focus. You got to focus that passion. Now, now, here's the thing. What is it about Charlie that when I get over here at 7 o'clock on a Sunday morning, he's down here on the keyboard practicing? I come in during the week, he's practicing. What is it about the band, Jimmy and, 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 and George and Drew? They're here early on Sunday morning, and they're practicing and getting these songs down right. They have a passion for music, don't they? They love it. They eat, breathe, sleep music. But that passion for music could be misdirected, but they're here on a Sunday morning focusing their passion for music on the things of God. So some of you maybe need to analyze what is it that you have a passion for, all right? Maybe it's something perverted. Well, then you need to pray through on that one. But focus your passion on something you can do for God. Maybe you love gardening. How many of you here love gardening and flowers? Well, by gum, we got a bunch of flower beds out here with weeds. <laughs> Fell for that one, didn't you? Focus your passion on the things of God and, and, and see how happy it can make you. Amen? One of the most passionate passages in the whole Bible is found in Acts chapter 2. You ought to read it sometime if you haven't. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and most of them had their cell phones out down on their lap playing video games and saying when are we going to get out of this service they were all with one accord in one place and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire it wasn't fire it wasn't a, sometimes i see pictures on the day of Pentecost where they put a a fire thing over there. There was no actual fire. It was describing the power of passion that was in that service that day. It, it was powerful. It was like a, a rushing mighty wind. Jenny and I went to a conference over in St. Pete 
of the United Pentecostal Church this, this last week over in Orlando. And uh, there were some services where the presence of God just w went through that place. And, and, it, and, the, and, the, and the Holy Ghost power just fell in that place. And there was no actual wind, but it felt like a rushing mighty wind. It felt like there was fire falling. It was passionate. People were passionate and worshiping in different ways. And, 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 and this is what happened on this day of Pentecost. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And uh, for you charismatic, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. But for Pentecostals, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Okay? And began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there was dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. And then what happened on that day of Pentecost is exactly what happens sometimes in this church. When the power of God is falling and God is moving and people are coming down the altar and people are getting saved and people are getting healed, there'll be two types of people. There'll be those that look at it and think, what a bunch of nuts. A bunch of crazy people. Why, why is Rita standing there with her hand raised, jumping up and down? What, 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 she crazy? Same person that go to a football game and jump up and down, right? And uh, on that day of Pentecost, there were the same two things that happened. There were those that said, ha, these are a bunch of drunk people. They did. They said, these, these are drunk. And other people said, man, what's going on here? We probably have two kinds of people here today. Those who are saying, what is Pastor Tom talking about? What an idiot. He doesn't know what he's doing. This church is a bunch of nuts, a bunch of uh, cults, who knows, and, and, and saying all kinds of things about us, okay? Then there's others of you here that are saying, man, what was that I felt during that song? What was that spirit I felt when, when Jeremy was singing Amazing Grace? You know, uh, what was that I felt? Is there something more to this? And, and Peter, he was the bold one who, who, who weeks before had, had denied Jesus three times, was a little wimp. And he stood out on that balcony speaking to the same folks, the same people that had yelled crucify him days before. And he said, Y'all just be quiet. Listen to me and what I say. Or in PT's version, shut up and listen. But in the Bible it says, uh, be this known and hearken unto my words. In other words, he lifted up his voice and got loud. And he says, these are not drunk as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. He tried to use reasoning, which some of you wouldn't understand this, but the third hour of the day was 9 o'clock in the morning. He was saying nobody gets drunk at 9 o'clock in the morning. But I can't exactly say that in this church because... <laughs> Some people have actually gotten drunk before 9 o'clock in the morning. But he says, these are not drunken as you suppose, but this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. In the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Guess what, folks? We're in the last days. God's pouring out his spirit upon all flesh in spite of a world gone crazy. In spite of a world that's gone nuts. In spite of a, our country go, turning its back on so many things. I believe that it's going to spring back and we're going to see... We're going to see revival in the churches. People are coming to their senses and saying, wait a minute, hold on a minute. We aren't going to stand for this any longer. We're going to stand for truth and justice. And, 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 and that's what Peter did. He stood up there and he said, this is that which was spoken of. We're going to have, I believe in these last days that we're in, we're going to have more miracles and healings than ever. Because here's the thing. God gives you what you need. And in this day and hour, we need healing. We need people being delivered from drugs and alcohol and fentanyl and all this other stuff. Amen? Amen? We need it. And so, first thing I want to talk about is passion is an intense, powerful emotion. I remember back in, a, in, a, in another world that I was in, I was about 20 years old, 21 years old, and I was a youth pastor of a church. And Man, I lived, breathed, I loved teenagers. I never wanted to talk to a bunch of old fart adults. Really, never wanted to. I would like, I like teenagers. And uh, people would ask me, what in the world, how do you put up with those teenagers? Oh, I love it. I had a passion for it. And all of a sudden I hit 30 and all of a sudden they started getting on my nerves. You know what I mean? It's like all their little petty dramas. And all of a sudden I transitioned and I no longer had the passion for that anymore. And, and, I, and I got a passion for other things, of the things of God. And, and adults that started appealing to me more and more that way. You know, if you let God, he'll direct your passions. And sometimes he'll change your passions. Amen? Amen. Passion speaks of ardent love, of just focused love. And, 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 and 
and, and something that overtakes you and the compassion of it takes you over. It denotes a boundless enthusiasm. When you have a when you have a passion for the things of God, it's not so hard to get up in the morning and go to church. It's not so hard to open your Bible and read it. It's not so hard to come home from work and can hardly wait. You know, there are times, um, uh, you know, I have a real passion for Jenny. I love that woman. And there are times during the day where I'm out doing stuff and I'm thinking of her and I'll, I'll text her a little note. I love you, baby. And she'll text me back. I love you more. And then I'll text back, I love you more, more. I love you more, more, more. And sometimes when, when I get home, you know, the dog greets me at the door. How many, how many love dogs? You know why? Because they, they love you back, don't they? I open the door, and there's the dog going, jumping up and down, and so happy to see me. And then I kind of give the dog a pat, and I'll, okay, get out of the way now. I got to do my real passion here. And uh, I'll go hug Jenny and say, man, I missed you today. Hmm. See, that's, that's a passion. A marriage without passion is a hell. Some of you can relate to that. When the passion went out of your marriages, it was hell. All of a sudden, every little, every little mistake, every little thing they do is hell. When you lose your passion for God, all of a sudden, the people of God, you're, you become judgmental, you become critical. Everything they do, ah, look at that Willie. Who does he think he is getting up here saying that prayer? Who does Jeremy think he is getting up there and singing Amazing Grace when after what he did last week? Ugh. Who does Pastor Tom think he is to start having his brother start a Spanish work on Sunday afternoon? Ah, you be critical of everything. When you lose your passion for God, you become a critic of the gospel. Amen? You become a critic of everything that relates to the gospel. Passion is probably one of the most motivating forces on the face of the earth, if not the greatest. It was a passion that caused uh, President Kennedy to give a rousing speech that, that, that encouraged the country that we were going to go to the moon. Haven't been there since with a man. But... He said this, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before the decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safe to Earth. He said no single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space, and none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. Why haven't we been there since? We had our passion there. Now some of that passion is coming back to go to Mars. and some, But basically the passion that was there to go to the moon it's amazing. Did you know that the computers they had to land that Land Rover on the moon had less of a computer than most of you have in your phone, even in a watch? And, and, they land, and actually, on the way down, the computer froze. How many of you ever had a computer froze? That's a panic time, right? Can you imagine landing that lunar module on the moon, and you're coming down, and the, 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 the computer is getting it ready to land and it freezes on you and you have to take over manually which is very hard on that and they, they did that they had to do that but there was a passion for doing that and and and, and the thing is is that not only did, did our country have passion for that there was a time when America had the passion for the things of God back in the 40s and 50s uh, an evangelist could set up a tent outside of a town and be there for a week or so, and people would come and flock out. Set up a, tump, a tent here in Tampa, and you'll get a few good church people to show up. That's about it. Right? All right? There was a passion for the things of God. Passions have changed, but we need, in this day and hour, we need to get back in passion for the things of God and focus whatever we have a passion for. Get that focus on using it for the glory of God. Amen? God has passion. The, the first account of God having passion was in the creation. Can you imagine how excited he was? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. And God began to move on the face of the water. Wow. He, he put the stars in place. He put the moon and the sun, and he got everything just right and got all the DNA sequences just right and all the stuff going on. He had a passion he was creating all that for you. He was creating, think about that. 
all the way the, 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 the moon and the sun and how we travel around the sun and all the different things. He was creating all that ahead of time so that he could make room for his greatest creation, which on the, on the, on the sixth day, he said, every day he said it was good. And on the sixth day, when he created mankind, it was very good. It was the ultimate thing. He, he had a passion for it. And, and, and the thing is, is that people that have a passion for God receive the power of God. God is passionate about showing his power to those who are completely in love with him. So you got to be in love with him to have the passion. Now, some people confuse that passion with lust. <coughs> some people lust after God. Oh, God. <coughs> Deliver me from my addictions. God, give me this. God, have Pastor Tom preach a nice sermon. Makes me feel good today. Oh, God, have Drew and them sing some songs that really entertain me. They're looking for a sugar daddy. They don't really love God. They're in lust with God. Some of our guys, you know, they, the girl looks at them two seconds and all of a sudden they're in love, right? Oh, she looked at me. Oh, oh. And they get to talking. Oh, I, I, she's good for my recovery. We're just friends. We've heard it all, haven't we? We're just friends. Yeah. And, uh, oh, man. I can't live if living is without her. Now we know we're in trouble. You better be able to live with or without someone or you're in trouble. Man. And so they fall in lust. It's called in addictions, it's called the big gulp theory. They fall in lust. And two weeks later, they're madly in love, and they can't live without each other. And all of a sudden, a month later, I can't believe I, I can't believe I like that. Oh, she's horrible. What a witch, right? It's a cycle. Jenny and I, we've seen this so many times, haven't we? Over and over and over again. Lust doesn't last. They think, oh, this person's wonderful. I just got to have her. So they go off to a motel room, and they have sex. And all of a sudden, how do I get away from her? <laughs> it's the pattern. It's the way it is. Right, Jenny? You know? There was uh I've told this story before, but there was one girl one time in our program and man, she was doing good. She got a job and was getting ready to get her kids back and and and, and, and everything about ready to get her own apartment. And all of a sudden the old boyfriend got a hold of her and did all the one liners to her. Oh baby, I love you, I can't live without you. You know? And the uh if you, you know, if you come back to me, I'll never beat you again. I'll quit using drugs. And then the one stupid line that women actually believe, I think I'm going to kill myself if you don't come back to me. They actually do that, don't they? And the women sometimes fall for it and vice versa. Okay. And so this boyfriend, he got, he got, he got a hold of her. And she called Sister Jenny and it was on, the phone was on the bed. She had on speakerphone and we heard her. She had this, this real Southern accent. And she kept, and Jenny kept trying to talk her out and saying, no, you aren't ready yet. Stay, don't go, don't go. But he loves me. <laughs> and she kept saying that. And, and it just kind of drilled in her head, but he loves me. <laughs> but, but remember what he did before, he beat you. Remember the drug, but he said he'd quit and he loves me. <laughs> and she just had it in her head that she was gonna, so sure enough, there she goes put her back to square one with getting her kids back, put her, all that for a guy that loves hair, all right? And uh, I was, I don't know how long it was, maybe a couple weeks, it was a couple weeks or something later. All of a sudden she calls, oh, Jenny, oh, oh, he's gonna be me, oh, yeah, what do I do? And I so much, and Jenny had to put down mute because she didn't want, want her to hear what I said. <laughs> Tell her that he loves hair. <laughs> Jenny had to filter that away from me. <coughs> the phone. Oh man, aren't you glad I got a good wife that filters me sometimes? Oh, talk about uh, filtering, man. She got to filter sometimes. But how ridiculous it is sometimes. Be careful that some people lust after God. And as long as things are going good, and the sermon is just right, and the music is just right, and the air conditioning is making it cool, and man, church becomes a cool place to go to, they're fine. You know, um, that's lust. 
a lot of big churches now are changing the way they do some things. A lot of the big churches that have had great, wonderful, and, and, and exciting Sunday schools. My God, you walk in and they got a Sunday school department with all the figures and the things and, and, and amazing. And a lot of them, uh, they, they analyze, uh, Barney, who does studies on this, analyzes and says, what's going on? These kids are coming to Sunday school and they have great big Sunday schools. And then when they reach 18 to go into the adult church, they never come back. And they realized that these kids were being entertained so much, and they had, it wasn't real church, it was entertainment, it was stuff, yes, they were learning the Bible, yes, it all looked nice and pretty, but they had never experienced real church. And so, when they turned 18 and they went to the main church, it's like, this is church? And so they've changed their ways now, and that's why sometimes when we have kids come, we want them to sit in at least part of the service, or once in a while, so they need to see what church is like. Um, but... Uh, the, the thing is, is they, because those kids were enamored and in love with the entertainment and the puppets and all the stuff like that, and they never really fell in love with Jesus, they fell in love with the system. And sometimes people come to church and they're in love with the system. You ever hear this line? On, on TV, a lot of, or on radio, churches that advertise their church, they'll use usually a couple different lines. They'll go, our church is growing. Oh, we have... Jesus was a failure if that's the case. He had three people at the foot of the cross. All right? And they go, oh, come to our church. We're a friendly church, and we shake your hand, and we make you feel at home. And all that's good. We should shake people's hands. We should make them feel good at home. But that's not the purpose of church. The purpose of church is to find Jesus, whether there's one person, two people, or a thousand people there. Amen? It's to find Jesus and have your passion, not in the church, not on Pastor Tom, no matter how great you think I am or how bad you think I am. I don't know. It, the passion cannot be on the church, on our New Beginnings program. It can't even be a passion on you and your recovery, where you're focusing on your recovery so much, your focus isn't on God. Your passion has to be for the things of God and his righteousness, the Bible says, when you, when, when you seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, these things shall follow. Some people seek after the experience of God instead of God. Some people seek after healing and they, they, ask, they want God to do all these wonderful things in their life. But they're really not seeking after God. They're seeking after what God can do for them. And here's the problem. When all of a sudden things look bad and things don't happen like you want it to be and you get a sickness and God doesn't heal you, did you know God didn't always heal in the Bible? The Bible says there was a time he went to his homeland and he did very few miracles there because of their unbelief. When he healed blind Bartimaeus, oh, that was so wonderful. He's coming through and, and, and he heals blind Bartimaeus. He passed out dozens of other people that had illnesses and did heal them. He healed one right there. You see? So sometimes God heals. Now this doesn't preach very well. You don't have to amen it. Sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes you give in the offering and God blesses you with finances and a job. Sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes he makes you go through some hard times because he wants to see whether you're lusting after him, whether you're wanting a sugar daddy, or you're really in love with him, come hell or high water, come no matter what comes your way, come whether you get sick, whether you don't, whether you feel like it or not, whether your job works out, whether the electricity gets shut off, by God, you're going to serve the Lord. That's what God's looking for. Why do you think he puts us through some tests sometimes? He's testing us to see what we're made out of. Amen? People. That are passionate receive his power. Do you know, God's looking for people who, be, who will be passionate about him. It's possible that we don't see the power of God like we'd like because we're maybe not that passionate about God. Can you imagine? Just imagine if when we were singing that song, Power in the Blood. If everybody here in this place were in one accord. You know, sometimes the people that are passionate about God, there's other people in the service that aren't. And did you know sometimes that sucks the very energy right out of them? Can you imagine if we were all passionate about God and we were singing that song, there's power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from the, how many have experienced being free from the burden of sin? 
Would you be free from the burden of sin? Man, some of you ought to be shouting on a song like that when we sing it. There's power in the blood. Be passionate about the things of God. Moses, he was passionate about Israel. And you know what? The miracle didn't happen right away. They, they did all kinds of stuff, you know. Um, uh, they, 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 they turned the water into blood. They did lice. They did frogs. They did all these things. And um, the, 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 um, the magicians copied most of those things. And Moses could have got discouraged, you know, um, uh, and, 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 and said, well, you know what? This isn't working. I give up. I'm going home to go tend sheep with my father-in-law. But Moses kept going on and on until finally heaven came down and glory filled that place in Egypt. And the death angel came over and, 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 and a miracle happened and the death angel passed over uh, the houses of Israel. And, and all of a sudden Pharaoh had to say, let him go, let, my, let his people go. As the passion of Moses and God increased, so did the power of God. Sometimes God puts you through a test. Sometimes he puts you through a fire and, and a temptations and stuff so he can see what you're made out of. And when you pass out through that fire and you're cried in the fire, you come out as gold. And that's when God can really use you powerfully. Amen? Amen. That's when God can really use you. 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 4. This is what, this is what Paul says. And I, brothers, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech, or wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. He said, for I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. He said, I was with you in weakness and in, and in fear and in much trembling. Why was that? Because he had a passion for the things of God. Sometimes a passion for the things of God will knock the ego right out of you. Sometimes the passion for the things of God will put you on your knees. It'll put you down where you know that it's not about you, it's about him. He said, in my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but it was in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Demonstration of the spirit and of power. That took a passion. It wasn't just getting up and preaching a nice sermon saying, well, we're all here today, children of God, and God's going to richly bless all of us today. Just put your money in the offering and God will multiply it tenfold. And when you come to our church and listen to our music and, and, and listen to the wonderful sermon that we preach, you'll go out of here feeling so wonderful and so good because God is so good. The Bible says in the last days, people have itching ears. Don't listen to that garbage. Don't listen to that mess. If they're not preaching about the cross of Christ, they're not preaching about Calvary, they're not preaching about the sacrifices. I tell people sometimes that, uh, you know, that, that preaches uh, health, wealth, success stuff. I say, well, you know what? If that's true, that if you pay your tithes and are faithful, God's going to bless you financially. Then I guess all the disciples were cheating God and stealing from God because none of them must have paid their tithes because all of them but one died a martyr's death for. You might die a martyr's death. Well, that doesn't preach well. Oh, I know what y'all want me to preach. Just put your money in the offering and God will bless you. Come down here and let me lay hands on you with my magic hands. And, you, and, and I'll knock you over 20 times and you'll come up feeling so good and God will heal everything in your body. Yeah. Maybe, maybe not. I can tell you one thing, we serve a good God. And he might test you. He might try you. But you've got to come out tried in the fire. You got to come out of through your trials. The Bible says rejoice in your trials and your temptations. Why is that? Because it gives God an opportunity to see what you're really made of. 
when, 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 you, when you go, uh, those of you who have been hooked on drugs and you go by that drug dealer, and he says, you straight? <laughs> Tell the story of my nephew when he was here. Remember, Eric? He's probably listening to me right now down in Miami. When he came from Bible school and spent a little time to help us out here, he liked to jog in the morning. And he was going to jog in, and he comes back, and he tells me one day, he says, man, there must be a lot of gay people around here. <laughs> I had two or three different people while I'm jogging asked me if I was straight. I said, I'm not gay. <laughs> he didn't know what that meant, you know. I had to school him. On that thing. <laughs> oh, what that meant. Next time, come up here. You look like a drug dealer, Willie. Come on. Oh, 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 <laughs> I'm a one God apostolic tongue drawing a whole wrong born again believer. I believe in every last power of Jesus' name. I've been washed in the blood, sanctified by the Spirit, and I expect for you to do the same. You need to get saved, brother. Oh, don't be a weak kneed Christian. Walk by that drug dealer instead of go, I couldn't help it, he stuck it in my face. Stick the gospel in his face. Amen. Have a passion for the things of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 21, it says this I speak as concerning reproach. As though we have been weak. Howbeit, wheresoever and any is bold, I speak foolishly. I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in labors, more abundant in stripes, above measure in prison, more frequent in death often. Y'all don't have to raise your hands. How many of y'all been in jail or prison? Well, some of you raise your hands. Okay. Guess what? You have something in common with Paul. He spent the majority of his life as a Christian in prison, in jail. He was beaten. All this stuff, he says, and here he talks about it. Of the Jews, five times received I, received I 40 stripes, save one. Thrice I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Not like some of you were stoned. <laughs> Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the deep. In journeys often, man, this, this, this reads like, like gloom, despair, and agony on me, right? In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen. Wait a minute. Paul must not have been saved because what I hear a lot of times preachers preach is when she gets saved, everything's going to go great like country music played backwards, right? You get your dog back, get your wife back, get everything back. Doesn't work that way. He said, in journeys often perils of water, perils of robbers, perils of my own countrymen, perils by the heathen, and perils in the city, and perils in the wilderness, and perils in the sea, and perils among false brethren. He was even criticized by people in, in the, in, 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 that were calling themselves Christians. In weariness. Did you know Christians, we can become weary? Yeah, amen. In weariness. And painfulness. In watchings often. In hunger. And thirst. In fastings often. In cold and nakedness. Wow. You'd think that Paul would have became so bitter. That he just... I can't believe God treated me this way. I did everything for God I should. 
and here he's treating me this way. I'm going to prison. I'm doing this. I'm getting beaten. I'm getting robbed. Why is it God protecting me from all these things? Yet Paul became the writer of two-thirds of the New Testament while he was in prison. God used him. If you are focusing your life and your passion on your job, on things, on money, on status, on all these things, you will be sorely disappointed someday. Because all those things are going to rust up and disappear. If you're stuck on your body and how wonderful you think you look and you look in the mirror all the time and primping yourself, understand that body's going to change. How many know that? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Planned on going on a dive in a couple months. And I haven't been diving in a couple years, and it's amazing how much that tank. I put the tank on last week and went in the pool a little bit trying to practice. Amazing how that same tank weighs about a thousand pounds more than it did two years ago. Man, we get older, things get a little crotchier, don't they? You know, and uh, if your if your life in this, if your hope is in this life, if your passions are in the things of this world, you're going to be disappointed. But it, it's like the song says, "This world is not my home." I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. That's what it's all about. It's about I have a mansion over the hilltop. Amen? It's about so that you have something is better than this world. If this world is all we got, Paul said, if in this life we have hope, we are all men most miserable. No wonder people come to church sometimes and they're looking like they just swallowed a bottle of, I don't know, castor oil or something. Or my cooking. They're so miserable. Why is it? It's because, oh, well, I can't believe that boss yelled at me today. Oh, well. To God be the glory. Yeah, get over it. Things happen. Things are going to come your way that are bad. Okay, get through it and get on and quit feeling sorry for yourself and trying to call everybody in the world, bringing them down with you. Some pastoral advice. The Bible says, think on these things, those things that are pure, those things that are good, those things that are holy. Quit thinking on all these bad things. Think on good things and see how then sometimes that'll make good things happen to you. And even if those good things don't happen, even if you don't get that job, even if you don't get this and you don't get that, you don't get the car you want and this and that happens, you'll still have God. He won't fail you. He'll be there with you when everybody else fails you. When everybody around you disappoints you. When it seems like everybody around you is failing. God never fails. But then Paul in Romans, he kind of changes what he says there. After saying all those things about what happened, he says this in Romans chapter 8, 38. He says, for I am persuaded. I am moved. I am changed. My mind is changed. I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities. And that, that, that's talking about the powers in, 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 in the atmosphere. Nor principalities or powers. Did you know there are powers and principalities in here that is trying to rob you of your salvation? They're right now trying to tell you, Pastor Tom doesn't know what he's talking about. And, and your mind goes to, on a hundred things. Oh, I can hardly wait till he's done. Till I can do this and that. And there's powers and there's principalities that are trying to edge you off the off the seat of being in love with God. Amen. Amen. He says, "Nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height." He covers it all. Nor height, nor depth. Nor any other, if that doesn't cover it, or nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. You want to know how to get passionate for God? Fall in love with Him. Lanny Wolf wrote a song years ago. I was there at the Bible College when he wrote it. I keep falling in love with Him over and over and over and over again. 
I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. When I first fell in love with Jesus. How many, when you first fell in love with him, you were in love? Well, guess what? Love is a choice. If you say you don't love God, that's your choice. Choose to love God. Choose to love him. And then see, when you love him, see how the passion will come. you got to love him. Not just have passion for him. Love him and the passion will come. No wonder God was able to show his power in Paul's life. Acts 19.11 says that God wrought special miracles by the hand of Paul. The word special in that verse denotes something that, that's not ordinary. The passion of Paul for the gospel moved God to the point of special work in him and extraordinary miracles through him. And he didn't have a, a very, he had a pretty, pretty good life before he became a Christian. Once he became a Christian, he got persecuted, he got talked about, he even got, got gossiped about behind his back by fellow Christians. If we could be consumed, consumed with a passion for the things of God, he will respond with his power. Amen. Remember, passion is boundless enthusiasm. Our enthusiasm for the things of God need to become limitless. That, that even means now, let me tell you how you can focus that passion. It's not just in coming to church. It's not just in your Bible reading. Uh, Francis Schaeffer, one of the greatest theologians of the 21st century, he, he, he wrote a series of uh, movies and books uh, called uh, this, uh, How Shall We Then Live? And, and uh, I was uh, privileged, actually, to be able to go to one of his seminars for a week and uh, listen to him. Uh, talk about these things and, and he said be passionate for the things of God in all that you do he said when you're a Christian there is no such thing as secular if you're a doctor be a doctor for God if you're a plumber be a plumber for God if you're an artist be an artist for God do what what you do and do it passionately and let other people see that what you do is great and it doesn't always he, he was saying if you're an artist you don't always have to do you paint a beautiful sunset or you paint a beautiful ocean scene he said you don't always have to put a bible verse on it to make it christian it can just be the fact that it's a beautiful picture the most beautiful picture you could ever paint of the of a sunset and it and god will be there whether you put a bible verse on it or not i used to after his seminar you know and i uh, I, I went and got some preaching licenses and stuff. Um, I used to hate the question. They would ask you, do you have a secular job? And then I remember Francis Schaeffer said, there's no such thing as a secular job. What you do on your job is for God. You do the best you can. You become the best witness you can on that job. And, and uh, I hated answering that. Yes, I got a secular job. I'm a mortgage broker. I do real estate. But no, there's no such thing. Being a pastor is not, it, 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 some of the people, you work as plumbers or whatever, that's not, you're, you're doing a godly work for God. Be the best plumber you can. Be the best, best carpenter you can. And see how then God blesses you and it makes it where you can start paying tithes and be faithful to the house of God and, and see how doing your best for God ends up blessing you. Amen? Be all that you can be for God. And, and, and be passionate in your work and focus that on God and say, I'm going to be the best toilet bowl cleaner today I can be. Amen. I'm going to be the best job of cleaning up all these cigarette butts that all these idiots leave around at New Beginnings all over the place in places they're not supposed to smoke. You know what? I'm going to go pick those things up. And I'm gonna, you know, that's godly. It is. That's godly. That's that's as, come on up, worship team. That's that's as important as coming here and worshiping God and praying and doing those things. Is doing the work of God. Amen. Can you imagine what a witness you could be on a job when you when you work at McDonald's and you do the best job you can and you get promoted to line chief and then you get promoted and you end up being the manager of McDonald's? What influence you can have over people for Christ? You see, all those things. Do the best you can in what you're doing. Don't be so sloppy and think, oh, well, I'm a Christian. I don't have to do this that well. Be passionate in those things. Remember that, that our enthusiasm for the things of God need to become limitless. And that limitless passion for God will give us limitless power to overcome sin. We need to be passionate about our praying, passionate about our praising, passionate about our witnessing, passionate, pa uh, uh, passionate about our giving and our church attendance and 
and love for each other and passionate for the love of God, for God. To God be the glory, not for our glory, to his glory, amen? <clears throat> to be passionate. Passion and power. They're inseparable. We'll never have the power of God unless we get the passion for God. We need to pray for God to help give us the fires of passion in our lives. I believe that the fire mentioned in conjunction with the baptism of the Holy Ghost was talking about power and passion with God. It says, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. Hallelujah. I want our church to be full of the Holy Ghost. I don't want to be a bunch of namby-pamby, wimpy Christians that pass a drug dealer on the street and get all upset. I don't know what to do. Be bold. When you walk into the Circle K and they always put that big thing of beer right there with all the ice rolling off of it right in front of you. Instead of go, oh. Look at that beer and go, in the name of Jesus, thank you, God, for delivering me from that. And go get your Coke or whatever you're going to get. Really? Start being strong. Start being strong for Christ. I quote this all the time. I love Rosie Greer's song he sang years ago. Be bold, be strong, for the Lord our God is with you. Amen. Could we sing? Hallelujah. Be passionate. Being passionate means giving everything you got to God to be the glory. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's bless you. Hallelujah.
passion for the things of God. When you get passion for the things of God, everything in your life gets easier. It really does. Even if it gets harder, you understand it? If it gets harder, it gets easier. The harder it gets physically, spiritually, the greater it gets. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Before we dismiss, uh, uh, we want to pray for Achia and her two sons. Um, we need to pray for them. But also, I want us to keep in mind the people down south, the hurricane. I mean, we are happy. We are blessed that it didn't hit us. But there's a lot of people that are not so blessed it hit them, okay? It wasn't because we prayed harder. It just is what it is. But uh, we want to pray for them. And also uh, for Cuba, uh, we want to pray. that They're having it tough down there now. We've been sending food to Cuba, and uh, we got a big load of food over at the center that Monday is going down to Pine Island, and down there we're trying to help what we can with food, and we got baby diapers, and we got camp, and we got uh, cleaning supplies, and we got tarps and tents and stuff that uh, that we have to go down there uh, Monday down to Pine Island, but uh, that's not enough. They need prayer. Amen. Brother, you want you want to, who was it that wanted to come pray for Cuba? Who was it? Is he here? Amen. But, uh, Cuba. Amen. Thank you, brother. All right, let's pray for you. How about we have Herman do it? Come on. Do it in Spanish. Let's pray. Amantísimo Dios Padre de infinita misericordia, te adoramos, te bendecimos, damos toda gloria, honra y alabanza a tu santo y bendito nombre, Dios de gloria. Aleluya. En esta hora, Señor, tu palabra santa dice, clama a mí y yo te responderé y te enseñaré cosas grandes y ocultas que tú no conoces. Padre, presentamos esta isla de Cuba en esta hora, Dios del cielo, para que tu mano poderosa, tu mano santa, tu mano, Dios de gloria, tu brazo extendido, Dios mío, venga sobre esta isla, está muriendo de hambre, hay necesidad, Dios de gloria, y rogamos, Señor, que tú suplas, Dios mío, para esta nación, Dios de gloria, de huya, en el nombre del Padre, del Hijo y del Espíritu Santo, pedimos todas estas cosas, Señor. Amén y Amén. Gracias. Jesus, we ask, oh God, that you touch those down south, Florida. Oh God, those on Pine Island, those of God who are hungry. 
Those who, are, who have needs of God, that we can help meet those needs, but God kept them spiritually. God, I know some churches down there that are, are ministering day and night and passing food out and, and bringing the gospel message to them. God, we ask that you touch them, protect them, keep them safe, Lord. In your precious name, touch a chia, two sons, oh God. We ask that you keep your hand upon these, oh God. In your precious name, amen. Mr. Jesus, can you shake hands and pray?